So when we discuss the climate crisis and when we discuss the, how we can say, uh, solve the climate crisis, mostly, so in my experience, mostly we talk about the level of CO2, about targets, about new technologies. Uh, and even inside the climate justice movement, if we talk about system change, mostly a uh, discussion about the economic system follows. Um, because you are an expert in economic, I would love to ask you the question, um, can you explain if in a while we should add more to the topic, to the discussion, uh, in how to stop the climate crisis, and is it necessary to connect these struggles? How long should I say? <laughs> Um, as long, long as you wish. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, being here. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking in front of you here today. Um, whenever I'm at a climate camp, I feel very um, at home also. I find lots of hope. Um, till, uh, starting from Katrin's question, well, it's a shame that even that many of us we are already seeing how the climate impacts are getting more erratic. We are watching more and more extreme weather events that was not so normal or according to a lot of scientists prediction that uh, even the scientists didn't expect that those kind of events we are even now seeing happening like we know the recent floods that happened in Germany the uh, extreme weather events in Canada, but despite all of that, what we see, there is still a lot of discussion going around, like even in the movement or in the broader movement, the framing is around fight for 1.5 or this uh, we can save only by fixing maybe some policies or just phasing out certain things. So um, I think what Katrin was also trying to uh, point towards that it's and also because maybe many of us we already know like how this climate crisis was created as we know it's not just a technical crisis that happened because of some climatic events that that's it's created by humans i mean we are all here we saw, so we know we are resisting the rhineland coal mine so we know <clears throat> it's happening from the co2 um but at the same time this stopping the co2 is just not about phasing out from oil coal and gas and if you just all switch to renewables it's not like just this, by fixing one element of it, we will be able to fix the whole crisis. Uh, so this is what we also try to put forward in discussion, that this whole climate crisis that we're seeing is a product of a bigger system, bigger economic system that is, um, yeah, this also we all know, like capitalism. But when we talk, one example we see, like why we say that this Econ it's, it's the economic system that created it, not just the energy. Why, why? The main reason behind that we see that the way the companies, the bigger companies, even the, the way these uh, big oil, coal, gas companies, despite knowing that their uh, operation and this kind of energy consumption is at the core of climate crisis, it's risking threatening our whole planet. And at the moment, they're already in Bangladesh, we already at the moment, we have six million climate refugees and the number is going up. So it's up to recently, the climate crisis was happening in other parts of the globe. Maybe it was not feeling here, not being felt in, in global north. But what's happening that we see that it's now getting more and more out of control. So all of this, despite knowing that these things are happening, no, despite knowing that people are being impacted in other parts, we were not being able to stop these companies. No, And there were this huge corporate lobbying that was going behind. So now when we see that there are so many of us people in the streets, we are demanding this kind of bigger system change, it's still not happening. There is a huge lobby that keeps going behind and that stops this whole kind of, the, the, there is this other politicians who they're listening to. So when we look at all of these dynamics, one thing gets clearer and clearer that it's not just not a technical problem, it's a social problem. So the climate crisis is a problem of a social justice issue. And if we say that we need to solve this crisis and, and we cannot just look at it in, in different separate parts we have to also look at it in, in its whole entirety and that's kind of what I guess Catherine was also pointing towards that we need to then interconnect the fights as well so then the climate justice fight is just not about the people in one place of the world it's about everybody who's impacted but it's also and it's supposed to be needs to be also an anti-racist fight it needs to be a feminist fight it 
needs to be also like like classified. So we have to struggle, like interconnect all of this struggle, because only then we will be able to create a broader space for the system change that we need to be able to avert this crisis just by fixing going from coal, oil, gas, just from fossil fuel to switching renewables, which is also not possible. But even if we try to do that, we will end up reproducing a lot of other forms of oppression and it, we, we might end up with then the new green colonialisms, I guess. Um, yeah, so this is, of course, this again too broad and too big, but this maybe this is uh, an opening for the other uh, discussion that we will be able to do afterwards based on specific questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Ms. Adora, uh, we just learned also from Tony the importance um, to think and to act intersectional. And, well, like I said, I met you at the UN Climate Conference, a walk-in on that issue. So can you tell us more why and how civil society is pushing to include gender justice and decolonial justice? Yes, so, yeah, first of all, thank you very much, everyone, um, for being here and listening and participating in the talk. I'm also very honored to um, join these amazing people here. Um, it's my first time in a Klima camp here in Germany, even though I've been living here for some time, so it's quite exciting to see the activists here and getting to know <laughs> the things that I normally follow on my social media. Um, yes, yeah, so intersectionality was uh, already like approached by Tony really well, so that's indeed an approach which is more systemic and it's dealing with, you know, it's about recognizing um, um, different um, faces of oppression or different oppressions that people have just because of, um, yeah, because of different things like their gender, their class, um, their um, things like this um, tags that we created for <laughs> for organized society and create oppressive systems. So an intersectional look into, um, into climate change is necessary if we are fighting for climate justice because all these oppressive systems, they, are, they belong together and they have to be fought for or fought against in a systemic way. So this is the first thing. And then um, why do we fight for um, gender justice in if, for example, in the context where we met in the climate negotiations. Um, because we, um, like, I was part of this, um, one of the interest groups, or groups of interest, constituencies, we call it constituencies, in the climate negotiations, which was the women and gender constituency. And uh, through the years that I participated in that space, um, we always uh, had this very systemic approach to also um, not only bring you know feminist ideas to the climate ne to the climate decisions, but also try to interconnect with other uh, fellows or with other people there who were let's say on our side, so indigenous peoples, uh, farmers, also youth, um, so different people who are fighting for justice in that space. And so, why do we fight for that? Because we do see the climate crisis as a social phenomenon, as a phenomenon which is made uh, mainly constructed by us and is affecting people, is also affecting other species, but we have to be responsible for that. So we, th we see it through a social perspective and also seeing it as a very, as reproducing, um, well, it's made by in a, in unequal, in a very unequal system and it's also reproducing these inequalities further. Um, the more we, we see the impacts of climate change. So therefore we, we fight for gender justice because um, we depart, we start from the, this, uh, this knowledge that this is a social issue and therefore how we do it in, the, in, the, in the, that space, for example, in the international negotiations, it, there are different ways to do it. So one of them I, I said, it's also, and it's very important to do this um, solidarity, this co collective solidarity among other um, groups which are historically but still nowadays uh, still oppressed and marginalized when it comes to um, uh, decision making or when it comes to also benefiting from climate action like indigenous groups or local communities, um, young, young people. Um, so we organize with them in those spaces and try to come together with agendas which would benefit mostly the people. 
And what we, because what we see in those spaces is, as in most cases, like the higher you go uh, in, pos in, in decision-making spaces and uh, climate negotiations is a good picture of that, the more you see the, inequ the inequality is very clear, so you see a lot of um, mainly, uh, so there's not that much gender balance there, there's not, the uh, racial imbalance is also, race balance is also something that you um, see a lot and so this space is very uh, unequal and therefore um, we not only work together but we also try to make this more inclusive by bringing, for example, local activists from the global south to be present in those in the negotiations so that they can also shape because it's about their lives, their territories. And so, yeah, so representation is important for us, so we try to make sure that the, this, this space is more representative, organizing with other groups, and also, of course, talking to the media or pushing the decision makers who are in those spaces so that they can include, for example, our points in the text, in the, in the negotiation text. So we talk to the, there are different strategies to doing that. The one that I like the most is protesting and going to the actions. <laughs> I don't really talk to, I don't really like to talk to the negotiators, like, no, too boring. And <laughs> but, but yeah, we also do a lot of um, um, actions and, and yeah, we, that, which for me is the most fun part. Um, yeah, and what was your question? I thought, did I? I, <laughs> so, I have a follow up. Up question ah, okay, okay, okay. because um, I thought it was really interesting because in the German uh, climate justice movement uh, I don't hear often the word um, decolonial feminism mm -hmm. and I would love you because you said it to me one week ago like and I would love you to explain it maybe also a little bit more yeah it's fun because I'm also a very um, I like, yeah, it's been, I think we all are raised, whatever, wherever we are raised, we are raised in a very colonial way, right? Even if, if we're raised in the global north in like former colony or in former colonies, we're all, the system is still very like colonial in the, in the mindset. And so it's very recent for me to also, um, that I have been finding and learning about the colonial um, ways of thinking and approach and also the colonial feminism. But from what I've been um, meeting in my work, but also in my readings, um, the colonial feminism is a lot about how, I think it's a really non-binary way of seeing things. This is because I think capitalism and um, yeah, and also colonialism uh, was one of the, for, for me, it's one of the things that makes us think in the wor thinks the word in a very binary way. So it's either a capitalism or anti-capital. It's like, it's no, it's a really complex system. Like, we have to fight capitalism. We have to fight these structures of power while still like in these contradictions of living in it. So I think um, decolonizing, for example, feminism is about. Um, first and foremost, trying to not have this very binary way of thinking and approach things, approaching gender, um, also about uh, like recognizing the plurality of people, a plurality of genders and bodies, and uh, not trying to think or hierarchize or making hierarchies of those, because this is something that racism and colonialism brought to us, right? Um, and so also it's about community and care uh, and not individual liberation. I think the colonial feminism is fighting against those feminists or feminisms which are like you have, which are empowering people or empowering people to be uh, uh, like benefiting from the really awful things that the system has, you know, like uh, uh, women's leadership and that's like like this kind of thing like it's not that I'm against it But it's about much more than that and it's also it's constructed collectively and it's con it's concerned about um, The territories for example uh, that we uh, inhabit so this place for example This is a really I think the colonial way of uh, approaching things so the, the connection with the the, the, so the spaces where we are is a part of also uh, thinking uh, decolonial feminism, and I could go on and talk about so much more, but yeah, I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Kathleen, um, Viserio. 
<laughs> well, it's a truly large international organization, a Christian organization, and it's over 60 years old, uh, committed to fighting poverty. Uh, poverty. And so how does the climate crisis affect your work? And also I think it would be really interesting to know, um, is there a change in how to include intersectional struggles in your organization and in your project? Yeah, also I have, would like to thank uh, for the inv invitation. It's also my first time in the Klima Camp. I have been invited before, but I never made it, unfortunately. So I'm very happy to be here. So as you say, we are a, an organization with a 60, more than 60 years of history. And of course, that is also 60 years of learning. And in recent decades, we saw that climate change is really threatening the success of our development work. So one of our main mandate is to support partners in the global south for sustainable development. We're working on different topics, health, human rights, agriculture, rural development and many more. And we see in many regions of the world that the approaches that have been um, used in the past are not working for the future. So we have to learn together with our partners where can we adapt, to what extent, and where have we maybe, yeah, assume that it, this success might be lost. So in areas where people might not be able to live in the future. We see this, for example, in large uh, urban areas in Southeast Asia that will be flooded very soon. So Tony, you have uh, referred to that in your initial statement. And I think this is a serious threat for a development organization because we, at the moment we are, in many cases, we are insecure. What shall we do? and what shall our partners do? So at the moment, we have started a learning journey. So that's, that has, uh, really, that's a very new process for us to understand, also with the, German, with the German based staff and our partners in the Global South from different countries, to understand the facts of climate crisis and develop new instruments. How can we react to that? How can we respond to that? And of course, one of, of our main mandates is to fight social injustice and um, yeah, help people to develop themselves and find um, approaches to, yeah, to combat the injustice they face. And gender is one level, of course, of injustice. And it can also be, that has also been um, said before by Zadora, it can be race, it can be class, it, and of course, they are all connected. And this is also our process of learning, to understand what is gender injustice and to what, yeah, what kind of instruments we can develop to, to deal with that internally and also in our projects. Thank you so much. So, Julia, um, you work with uh, education in the context of climate justice and development. Um, so you made like the brochure for our institute. Um, and so, which, in which different topics and aspects of climate justice are discussed? How does the brochure reflect on the intersectional struggle of, for climate justice and which role does the intersectional struggle play in your educational work? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inv the invitation. Thank you so much for the very good discussion right now. Um, I got already a little bit inspired by uh, what you said and um, yeah, I, I start first with the questions and then I, I start saying something some, about that. So um, first of all, um, when, when working with people um, and the word education itself starts with that, it's, it's often like we have to inform people about something, but I rather think it's uh, about finding a way together to discuss um, about which world we want to live in. So this is what I understand under education before, um, yeah, uh, and I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so uh, when we are talking about this kind of education, I think it is, it is very important to first start where people are. And um, I'm hearing all of this very, very interesting words and this discussion and about the terms intersectional and uh, race and gender and so on. But when working with young people, uh, very often um, they don't even know about uh, any form of climate conference. They know there's something, people are talking about climate conference, okay, there's something going on on this, on this very huge level, but they don't really know what it's about. 
when uh, they know about the climate crisis, but they often only know the um, yeah scientific things. Um, the natural there's going to be a natural disaster, and they don't really know about the social struggles behind that. So I think um, intersectional uh, education um, for climate justice is really one of the most important things uh, we have to do right now. Um, to, to talk about what, what does it mean to, um, to have gender injustice combined with racial injustice and maybe class injustice. Um, and that is what we tried to, to bring a little bit uh, with the help of very many great people into the brochure. So take a look, uh, check it out. It's great people who worked on it. Um, so we, we tried to portray uh, on examples what gender injustice is about, what uh, racial injustice is about. For example, we portrayed uh, the case of Vanessa Nakata. You, most of you know about her, but when working with young people, most of young people never heard her name. Uh, and it's terrible because most of them heard the name of Greta Thunberg, but not of uh, Vanessa Nakate. And um, we try to start at that point to talk about um, what does it mean for people to not be heard, to uh, be powerless because their voices are just not heard even though they are raising them. And um, I think that's one of the most important things about educational programs to, to, um, to work on those issues and to use the voices wh wh which are already there and to bring this to the people yeah, and discuss together with them which world we want to live in. <laughs>